I don't know how many of you are movie buffs. I know some of you attend the movies on a semi-regular basis anyway. Uh, Kitty and I have a routine we have. We see at least one a year. Uh, we're not real big movie buffs, but uh, occasionally our son comes down from Frisco, and he is a member of the Frisco uh, Library and Health Club Association up there, and they have a movie checkout rental thing, and he brings down a lot of times a movie with him, and at our Saturday night entertainment, one of the movies he brought down. Uh, a long time ago, and I don't remember how long ago, uh, I'm kidding remembers or not either, he came down and he brought with him, how many of you are familiar with J.R.R. Tolkien? Not too many. Have you ever heard of The Lord of the Rings? Okay. This movie was the one, the second movie in that trilogy uh, from J.R.R. Tolkien called, the, the trilogy is The Lord of the Rings. This movie is called The Two Towers. And it is a film adaptation from his book that he has written. And there are four of them now, I think. I know there's a trilogy, but I think there's another one out. I'm not sure. I, I don't keep up with that stuff. I depend on my son and wife to do that for me because that's just not sort of my thing. But anyway, in this particular movie, The Two Towers, there is a scene where one of the ladies in the uh, movie, her name is, and I'll probably mispronounce it, but Eowyn, E-O-W-Y-N, who is the niece of the king of Rohan. And again, these things, if you've not seen it, will mean nothing to you, but that's not the point of the, of the message today. So to give you a little background, uh, her father has died, and her uncle was the king of Rohan. She is out practicing, this young lady, her sword play in anticipation of possibly being involved in a battle. When along comes a man by the name of Aragorn. He is a warrior king. And he accidentally stumbles, you might say, upon her little private sword practice. She became all embarrassed, a little bit, you know, embarrassed about the situation she was out there doing. And she sort of belittles her own abilities and her ambitions. But Aragorn, with the great compassion that he had, tells her that she is the child of a king. That she is the child of a king and that she will have a heroic fate in life it, with great compassion he tells her these things to lift her spirits to buoy her up to help her to encourage her how many times each of us thinking individually have we possibly like Ilwin, put ourselves down as someone who's untalented don't have any talents don't have any abilities i'm unable to do that I don't have courage. I don't have strength. And I've heard all of those at one time or another from one or more individuals over the years. Too often we put our own selves down when we're far more capable of doing what we need to do than we understand and believe. Especially when we realize that we too are a child of the king. Not the child of a king, but the child of the king. Do we also forget that, that we are the child of the king. You know, what we used to be is in the past. I have heard people refer to that as B.C., you know, before church. I don't think that's an uh, uncommon expression or anything. I know some members of this congregation have used it, at least in my presence anyway. That, that, that's all B.C., that's the past. Things have changed since we all became a part of the church of God. Before God called us, opened our mind, and shown us His way. What we are is now. And we are as a begotten child of the King. That is the present. But the future holds even more so as the fact that we have a co-airship with Jesus Christ. And of course that airship is eternal life. Over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 it says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself, it bears witness with our spirit that we are, we are the children of God. You know, it's easy to read right over that. It says, We are the children of God. You know, think about that for a minute. Let it soak in. What does that mean? What does that encompass? It's an amazing statement. 
And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him. Has anyone in this room, please don't raise your hands, this is rhetorical. Has any of you ever suffered in your life? Physically, mentally, spiritually, any other ways? I can remember many times going through some dark times, difficult times, whatever you want to call it. One of them was especially, and I think I've relayed this before, I know somewhere I have, um, when I was first heard, it was Garner Ted Armstrong on the World Tomorrow broadcast in the summer of 1965. I was enrolled in the Air Force ROTC program and was one year away from my commissioning into the Air Force. Later, as it turned out to be a uh, missile silo commander, in which I had the keys to push the button to send the rocket off into space to go kill someone. But as I learned more and more about the truth, I resigned my commission and was court-martialed through the Air Force at that particular time in my senior year at Mississippi State University. Difficult time. Going before the commandant and the board to go through that court-martial. I was nervous as the old cat on the hot tin roof. But I trusted in God. And before it was over with, it wasn't near as bad as I... The anticipation, the thinking about it of what you've got to go through was far worse than the actual situation. And I don't want to belabor this story too long, but unbeknownst to me until many, many years later, there was a gentleman on the staff at Mississippi State University at the time who taught history. His name was Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson later came to Big Sandy to teach at the college there. Little did I know until that point in time until I got to talking to him that he was best friends with and was the tennis partner of the commander of the Air Force attachment there at Mississippi State at the time. And he had learned of my situation and had spoken to the commandant as to my sincerity, as to my... not never even met the man before that. But he knew of the circumstance and the situation. In, in my opinion, God provided a way. He provided a help. Grease to, you know, grease the skids to go through things a lot easier. And all of us has been through similar types of situation where we run into a difficulty in our lives. But it says here very clearly that if we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, there's another scripture that says, If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What's the promise? The promise of eternal life. The reward that we are looking at. The things that we have been promised. The blessings that we have received. We've got a few gray hairs in this congregation. Think back from the very beginning when you first heard the Word of God. And you began to be stirred to go forward and to do something about it. Think back over that period of time. In my particular case, it's 53 years. Of all the things that have happened in your life. And how, in many cases, we had times where we were very much concerned about the situation. But when it was over with, at least in my case, every case, it turned out to be far less of a problem than I'd I'd built it up to be. And I truly believe to this day, and will always believe this, that God guided me through it. That He gave me the wherewithal to get through it, even though I physically, personally, mentally were not capable of doing it. He gave me the strength and the ability and and greasing the skids again for me. That promise, of course, is eternal life. Page 137 of our hymnal, and I should have probably called Wes, but he probably didn't know this song either, is a song called A Child of the King. In verse 3 of that song, it says, I once was an outcast stranger on earth, a sinner by choice. Now, at first... Plus, you may say, no, but you know, every time we sin, it's a choice we made. We made a choice to do wrong, or we had a choice to do right. Now, we have sins of omission and sins of commission, things we maybe should have done and didn't do. But at the same time, most of our sins are things that we go ahead and decide to do. And then we have to pay the price sometimes. It goes on to say, oops, I lost my place here. I'm reading it. Uh, I'm a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. 
Now, we've got a lot of things going on in society today about aliens and, you know, illegal immigrants and everything else. Now, not aliens from outer space. I'm not talking about those aliens. Alien in the sense that this is, as we look further into Scripture, this is not our home. This is a transitional place that we are living in today until we go home. And I think more and more we see, especially in the things that we hear at the feast, that that is sort of observing and and celebrating that period of time that we are a in transition we're sojourners we're travelers we're strangers going through this earth looking for our home he goes on to say then an alien by birth but i've been adopted remember the scripture back in romans chapter 8 and it was in verse 15 where it says we have received the spirit of adoption but i've been adopted my name is written down book of life is your name there an heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown as a part of our kingship that we're going to be as a child of a king. Then the refrain says, I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I am a child of the king. How many of us really understand that and believe that and live our lives knowing that we are a child of the king? Again, I'm not saying a child of a king, as Eowyn was, but we are a child of the king. Too many times we see royalty in this world today that you know, the king of England, that particular type of royalty, sometimes are spoiled, rotten brats. Um, happens. Hopefully we're not, as a child of the king ourselves, taking anything for granted, but we're appreciative of the blessings that we have, the opportunities that we have, the knowledge that we have received and especially the future that we have that we have been promised. In the movie, Eowyn, after the encouragement from Aragon, goes on to many brave acts in her life. And even though she was deeply in love with him, he had was married to, I've forgotten exactly the, the time frame of it, but he ended up marrying someone else. So like in almost any analogy that you use, it breaks down. It would have been perfect if she had you know, ended up in the story and married him, but she went on and was happily married to someone else. How about us? As the song says, we were an outcast. We were a stranger on earth. We were a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. But now we have been adopted. And if children of God, then heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Such a marvelous future that we have promised before us. And I know we all live busy lives. Too busy too many times. Been there, done that many, many times. But do we think about that? Do we dwell upon that when we come into times of difficulty? Too often, it's so easy to let the cares of this world drag us down. I mean, it's, it's full of stuff. You know, decisions we've got to make concerning every aspect of our life, the difficulties you run into with health problems, financial problems, and family problems, children problems, all the kind of problems that come along in the lives of people. And I know for most of us in the ministry, we've talked to people over the years that you've heard it all. You think you can't, you haven't heard everything yet, and then finally, I mean, you hear something else that's that's different or worse we're like the song says strangers and aliens because we forget that this is not our home in romans 8 back there picking up in where we left off in verse 17 at verse 18 it says for i reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Those who are out before me today listening to us on the broadcast, and we'll hear this maybe later. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. I can't think of a a better description of this world, but the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, 
Even we ourselves groan with... Now, that's not Charlie getting up out of the chair. That's me. No, it's, it's all of us from time to time as we get a little bit older when we groan when we get up out of the chair. It seems to help. Have you, have you noticed that? If you groan a little bit, it, it helps getting up. I, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. We ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting, here's that word again, for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. You know, when I read this when I was 22 years old, I didn't really fully understand that. At age 74 now, I understand it a whole lot better. The body is getting worn down a little bit. Knees creak and crack and back hurts and all these other kind of things that we're all going through in our life. The movie itself and all of his movies are all about overcoming evil with good. They're a little bit bloody, so it's not one you want to take your really young kids to see, per se. But there is a good theme throughout it that good always wins out in the, in, in the end, although they leave enough of a hanger at the end of it for the next one, so you'd want to come see it as well. But it's only after they go through during the movie unbelievable trials and difficulties and battles and fights, and it's, it's, it's amazing the things they go through, but yet at the same time, the good still triumphs over the evil. As a child of the king, which we are, as strangers and sojourners in this world, what can we do? What can we do not only to help ourselves, but to help others enrich this time that we're spending in this alien world? To make it more wonderful, more marvelous, more profitable. What can we do to overcome as we travel to our home somewhere in the future? One way is to be responsive to other people. Now, you may say, well, how does that help? Well, just as Aragorn, even though, you know, he really had just met Eowyn, he recognized the despair in her voice and responded with words of hope, words of encouragement to her to help her, to lift her up. And yet there is no one who is more capable or that should have more hope than you and I. No one who has more ability to encourage other people. No one who has more answers to life's problems than we should have as we go through the teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the whole Bible that we have there is our, you know, it's our book to teach us how to live life, how to go through life. We have the ability to answer people's problems. All the problems that come through in life and to help them. And no one's more capable of doing that than each of us as a child of the king. How responsive are we sometimes to people? Or are we too wrapped up in the own world that we live in sometimes? And I know how difficult that is. I've been that way, unfortunately, with my family over the years. Too many other things going on in life to spend the amount of time I should have and take care of some of the things that I I should have done. In Psalms chapter 16, in verse 8, It says, I have set the Lord always before me. I think I can say easily, I've not always done that. I try to. I'm still trying. But I have set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. I can't be moved away from what I've been taught, what I've been given, the things that I have learned. And I can look back over the years and I know a large number of people who have gone through some of the exact same things I have as far as experience and education and training, who have been moved into a different direction. Therefore my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, and my flesh shall rest in hope. I don't know if there's anything more that we can you know, get out of that in the sense of the word, that the things that we should receive in realizing this, that we have hope. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation, no matter what the problems, the difficulties we go through, we have hope. In Psalms chapter 39 and verse 4, it says, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, you have made my days as a handbreadth, and mine ages as nothing before you. One day as it's a thousand years. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. 
I recognize the description of me in that scripture. But surely every man walks in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heaps up riches as no, not, knows not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in you. And that's where we are as a child of the King. Our hope is in God and in Jesus Christ and the promises that He has given to us. And how much do we take advantage of the opportunities that come our way to give that hope, to share that hope, and to teach that hope to other people? You know, the Bible says a lot about humility, being humble. But how does humility fit into helping other people? How does it fit into enriching our own life in this alien world that we lived in? In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and verse 14, is a scripture that you've probably seen posted in people's front yards. Next to John 3.16, it's probably one of the most common scriptures that you'll see in those kinds of situations. It says, If my people which are called by my name, it's talking to us, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. That's a pretty, pretty broad promise. Pretty specific promise in one sense of the word. Is it possible that God incidentally helps others because of us? I think so. I've been convinced of that for a long, long time. But it, He can't do that if we're not actively involving ourselves in the lives of other people as well. You remember the case of Abraham. God told him, I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. And I think that carries down. that We are a child of Abraham, as it were. God will bless those that bless us. He will curse those that curse us. So when we get upset at someone, rather than cursing them, let, let God take care of it. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. Years ago, Bob Roper, who was a formerly a member of this congregation, when I was preaching up in, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and I talked about driving up there and how many times we'd been cut off in traffic and how exasperating and frustrating and maddening it was sometimes. And that sometimes you almost say something you shouldn't say and wish you hadn't have said or whichever the case may be. Next time I saw him, he gave me this little gadget. And on there it had atom bomb, laser, and six or seven other different things of ways to destroy people. So just push the button. I can, you know, the button do it and quit worrying about anything else. I used it for a couple of times. It worked. <laughs> Destroyed several cars. But... Uh, it was one of those situations where, you know, we have to stop and think. You know, it doesn't do us any good. Somebody cut you off in traffic. Do you chase them down and try to cut them off? I experienced that one time with my dad driving back. We had a cabin over on a lake in, in Mississippi. And a guy cut him off, and dad reacted wrongly and sort of sped up and cut in front of him. And I thought for a minute there, after a few seconds of this happening, we were fixing to have something happen bad. But thankfully, dad had sense enough to let it go after that and then we went on but will we allow God to help others you might say through us in Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15 it says for thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity that's an amazing scripture the one that inhabits eternity whose name is holy I dwell in the high and holy place with him also, who is God going to dwell with? Those are who are of a contrite and a humble spirit. To receive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You know, does your heart just ever sometimes sink when something happens? You just really, just sort of takes the breath out of you almost. God says, I will revive you. I will lift you up. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 4 says, By humility... And the fear of the Lord come riches and honor and life. Riches and honor and life through humility. One who is humble thinks of others first and their self second. Is that difficult? It has been for me. I don't know about you. Maybe you're different. But sometimes it's very difficult. 
but it is simply not impossible for one who is a child of the king. It should become at some point in time almost second nature. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. When we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God in due time, He will exalt us. He will lift us up. He will raise us up. The next subject I'd like to discuss in this line is, are you a generous person? Rhetorical question. Please don't raise your arms, your hands. Are you a generous person? Now, some might quickly reply, I don't have any money. I don't have any extra money. But generosity is not always measured. In fact, it's probably more than likely it's not measured in dollars. But in the time and the effort that we can spend in helping other people. Are you someone who is compassionate, who's considerate, who's gentle in dealing with other people, who is hospitable to those around them, who's neighborly? You know what I mean by neighborly. You know, you pay attention to your neighbor's difficulties and problems. Our next door neighbor, she had knee surgery. And she has since that time uh, fallen four times. She's on up in age now. She's up in her upper 70s, 78, something like that. She got on a ladder in her laundry room and she fell backwards and landed on her bad knee. And she fell another time slipping on something and put a bruise on her arm that ran all the way from her elbow up to her shoulder. And I told her the other day, I said, you know, let me know if you need something like that and I'll fall off the ladder for you. So, <laughs> not sure I would or not. But anyway... We try to be good neighbors. She watches our place when we leave. We watch her place when she leaves. I told her I'd, you know, I'd take my flashlight over and hold it for the thieves as they were cleaning out her house. So, you know, be neighborly. Uh, we share our tomatoes from our garden with her and different things like this. Are, are we neighborly in the sense that we try to make friends with our neighbors and work with them? Are we compassionate? A situation like with David Williams and other people who have been sick. Um, going into hospice, and I know people in hospice seem deathly ill and they are but they do in most cases as Charlie said know you're there they recognize you people will respond to them sometimes they have proven that through many many studies that people even though they may not have their eyes open they may be technically you know completely out of it they are aware of the fact that you are there even though they cannot express that in Psalms chapter 78 and verse 38 it says being full of compassion forgave their iniquity, speaking of God, for he remembered that they, you and I, were but flesh and a wind that passes away. God knows. He understands we are flesh. It's not our natural state to be generous. We want to take care of ourselves. In Psalms 86 and verse 15 it says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion, of gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. And the fact that each one of us are here in this room today is a pure example of that particular statement as well. God sets the standard of excellence in generosity. And it's not all about money. Listen to the scripture over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 17, those does say something about monetary. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 17. For whosoever has this world's good and sees his brother has need and then shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how does the, the love of God dwell in him? How can we, when we see someone who is needy and we turn our backs and walk away from them, how can the love of God dwell in us? Sometime back I was reading an article in a magazine that I used to take and the writer made the comment in the article that generosity may mean, and listen now carefully to this, generosity may mean that we hit our internal mute button. Got a mute button on the clicker for the remote for the TV. Here's something comes up that we don't hear. Do we, when those situations and circumstances come up, hit our mute button? But the next time maybe that we are inclined to comment or critique some other person's actions, think about this scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. Finally, be you all of one mind, having compassion one another. 
having love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be pitying of others. We take concern and care for others. Be courteous. Don't render evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. Knowing that you are called and that you shall inherit a blessing. Don't bring ourselves down to the, maybe the, the order of business and the, the way people behave in this world. We set the example for we are a child of the King. If nothing else in the story, Princess Eowyn had courage. You know, a woman going into battle, in many cases, battling men much bigger, much stronger. Of course, you know, they worked those things out. But anyway, she had courage. If you saw the movie, you know that she ended up proving to be quite a force in battle. Killed some major enemies with her sword. But for us, having courage may mean, because for some people this is more difficult than others, if someone comes in the the back door back there that's new to the congregation, going up to them, introducing yourself, and welcoming them to the congregation. Let them know that they're welcome to be here. You know, hope they'll come back. Learning something about them. Difficult for some people more than others. Comforting someone who's had a loved one die. Nobody knows what to say. <clears throat> because in most cases, the best thing you can say is not to say. Just to be there to comfort them, to let them know that your presence is there. Because I guarantee you, I don't have, and I don't think I know of anyone else that has the magic words that is going to comfort them. But just your presence there says a lot. To visit someone in the hospital. Sometimes we have to go out of our way to do that. Or maybe even sometimes standing up for our beliefs. To have courage to do that. If someone is saying something that maybe they shouldn't say or is not right or not wrong, doesn't mean you want to necessarily you know, knock them in the head or you know, argue with them necessarily, but you stand up for and protect and explain your beliefs. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, it says, Be strong. Be of good courage. Fear not. Don't be afraid. For the Lord your God it is He that goes with you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. Now, I don't know how much plainer the Scripture can be. Now, you and I may subjectively make a decision that somebody has failed us or God has forsaken us when something doesn't happen. But, you know, we just need to wait it out sometimes. There's been a lot of times in some of the difficulties that I've gone through in my life when I thought, God's not listening. I'm on my own. Wrong. Wrong decision. Because in the end turn, he was there with me the whole way. He walked with me all the way. Strong is not about always mentioning and being... As strong is almost always having courage, being a part of that is, is carried with it. But it means help or strengthen in the context as well as of others. In the scripture found over in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 6, it says, They helped everyone his neighbor. And everyone said to his brother, Be of good courage. You know, be strong. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're going to have difficulties. We're going to have troubles. We're going to have problems that hit us in our life. It is a time sometimes of testing. Do we put our trust and our hope and our faith as a child of the King, in our King. That He has promised to see us through, no matter what the situation. Thankfully, hopefully, at least none of us have ever had to go through what Princess Ewan had to go through, where she had to take up a sword and go out and defend her land from the evil that was coming upon them. But in Ephesians chapter 6, picking up again where I left off in verse 11 and verse 12, it says, For we wrestle... Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It is against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, each of us should take upon ourselves the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, 
having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. That's our sword. Not like, you know, Princess Ewan had her physical sword. We have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and all supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for our saints. That we pray without ceasing. Our battle, as it said, is not against, you know, those around us. It's against ourselves, and it's against evil spirits. And in verse 19 it says, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly with courage, to make known the mystery of the gospel, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That's, a, that's an admonition, that we speak boldly as we ought to speak. As the child of a king, we should speak boldly and with courage. In Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4, it says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, or the tongue of a disciple, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him, to anyone that is weary. We put ourselves down. We, we don't take advantage of the things that we have sometimes, but we're far more capable of doing these kinds of things than we sometimes give ourselves credit for. Because we've been trained. We've been given the word. We, we have the sword of the Spirit. It goes on to say about the, the, the movie, just as Aragorn, Aragorn spoke to help Princess Eowyn, do we speak to help others? Do we take advantage of the situation to enrich our own walk as aliens? Because I think everyone in here knows when you help someone else, in the long run, you are more helped than they are. It just brings about a feeling of, of goodness that is as hard to replicate. In Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 14, it says, Can your heart endure, or can your hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with you? These are those days. These are the days. We sing at the Feast of Time a lot of time. These are the days of Elijah. These are those days. The days that I shall deal with you. And I, the Lord, have spoken. And I will do it. He says in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 14. For we are a child of the King. 